Good morning. I have a few announcements, and then I'll open it up to the rest of the congregation. Um, you will notice in your bulletin or on the email blast that we wanted to do a, um, a potluck dinner with Beth Jacob on April 7 at about 4 o'clock. But it has become so popular at Beth Jacob that they asked if we could switch it to April 14 here at the parish house because more of their members can show up and they want to share time with us. So there's nothing on our calendar for that day, I've checked, but I wanted to make an announcement that the potluck dinner that you may see in the email blast or the bulletin, they've asked us to change it as of Friday. So um, I don't think there's any objection, but we would love to have as many of them here as possible while we share a meal together and grow together as a community. Sec uh, we will make the changes upcoming in the upcoming, upcoming email blast in the next bulletin. This Thursday is Monday Thursday, which will be a foot washing service. And then Friday is a Good Friday service of light and shadow, which will be led by our very own David Schilling. So I encourage all people to attend as we prepare ourselves during this holy week for Easter. Are there any further announcements from the congregation? Barb. Oh, and then Ken. I just want to tell you what happened um, in 1940 on this day. Um, it, it was Easter, um, a very early Easter, and a big snowstorm, bigger than yesterday's. And um, there was a family in Highgate, Vermont, that was expecting a new arrival. Um, and they called the doctor, and he was able to get to their house um, in the evening. And um, after midnight, the baby was born, and they named him Alan. so privileged to have you as a member of our trustees for all the work you do and the love you give. So thank you, Alan, and happy birthday. Ken, you had an announcement? Um, we didn't have wood stove last week because of whatever was going on. There's also a reception today for the artist for the fabric for art, so there's a competing thing. Should we do any show of hands anybody who was willing to meet with wood stove? Two of us? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I guess everybody else is going to the reception. We will, we'll party on. All right. So wood stove after church upstairs in the parish house? Yeah. Okay. Marilla. Marilla from Spiritual Life. Just wanted to remind you all that the sign up for our vigil is in the narthex. So please sign up. Um, this is a call for help next week. I'm doing coffee hour. It's Easter, and I would love other contributions uh, appearing at the table in the kitchen anytime between 8.30 and 9.30 next week. So do you need desserts and little snacks? or? Yep. Okay. Okay. Whatever people want to contribute. Whatever they need. You make it, we'll eat it. All right. Sally? Sally? And this is just a reminder about the reception for all the fabric artists, some of whom will be coming, um, who are not here. And um, we welcome right. any and all. That's today, though, right? Yeah, today. OK. Tell us. Um, this is spiritual life, I think, uh, as well. Today is the, your last opportunity to uh, participate in the lilies. And I don't see any um, papers out for it, but if you let Marilla or me know afterwards, it, we can write it down and see that it gets in the bulletin. The pink slips are right there. there. Are on, yeah, okay. they're just not inside the bulletin. Okay, so there's pink slips there right. if you want to participate in that. Tim. Uh, the final PINS announcement today is the day that um, I need to have the gift cards 
For those of you who have forgotten, which of course happens, um, go outside the box here, and there's various ways you can still get uh, a donation to me. You could write a check out to me, and I will cash it and then get a gift card myself. I'm already doing that, so it's not at all an inconvenience. Um, you just hand it to me today um, at church or leave it in the parish house, and I will pick them up. Or you could bring it to my house, to Pinewood Road in Montpelier, but trying to make it easy for you as much as possible. If for some reason you still want to do it in a slate, that's fine. I, we will, I will bring them to DCF tomorrow, but I also will bring them, say, you know, next week or something, if we have any ones that come, that lag. Okay, and thank you all for your uh, support. So I just want to remind everyone that these palms, we will wave them during that song, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, which is our hymn of preparation. So this is the reason we have the palms out. When we stand for that song, we will wave it back and forth to the rhythm of the beat. If there are no further announcements from the congregation, I invite you to enjoy a moment of silence and music before worship. Good morning, my beloved. I greet you, my family, with the love of Christ. On behalf of our community, I would like to welcome all of you, whether you are here in person or joining us online, to the Old Meeting House. The Old Meeting House is an inclusive community that celebrates your uniqueness and welcomes all into this sacred space. We hope that in the time we share together that you find yourself surrounded in God's loving embrace. We pray that you are open to receive her blessing. And we pray that God's blessing of unconditional love inspires you to unbecome and become the person you're meant to be. I invite you now to enter a moment of silence as we prepare for worship. Will you pray with me? Loving God, take our hands as we continue on our Lenten journey. Breathe love and life into our weary hearts and shine light where there is darkness. Open us and teach us how to be humble, compassionate, discerning along your way. 
And may your Holy Spirit abide within us as we endeavor to do your work and will in this world. Amen. The liturgy of the palms is taken from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. I invite you to open your bulletins and let us read responsibly the blessing of the palms. God be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the God most high. Let us pray. God, today we remember that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, meek and low. You have shown us the way of humble service, a path to God, and we pray you help us to follow. I invite you now to stand in body or in spirit as we sing our opening hymn, My Song is Love Unknown, number 222.
please remain standing as we turn to page 641 and read responsively our psalm. Be gracious to me, O God, for I am in distress. My eye waste away my grief, my soul and body also. And the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances, those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. I have become like a broken For I hear the whispering of many, terror all around, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O God, as I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Please be seated.
The First Testament reading is taken from Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who, who will declare me guilty? So ends the reading. That was a time in our service where we share our prayers, joys, and concern. And I would like just to share one joy with you, and that is I just love this weather. <laughs> I'm so excited to go out cross-country skiing today and tomorrow. <laughs> I do wish I hadn't changed out my snow tires, though. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me write this down in big letters. <laughs> Are there any other, any other prayers, joys, and concerns from the congregation? I have one, Rumi. Hey, Marcia. Um, this is a concern and then a joy. Um, so grateful that June is with us this morning. She spent part of the evening, the night, in the hospital, and we did not expect her to be here this morning. And as we're frantically figuring out how to live without her, she appears. So <laughs> <laughs> prayers for June's continued good health. Let us pray for her health. Oh, we need a microphone. Sure. Testing? Okay. I'd like prayers for a friend who, um, whose husband recently had a heart attack followed by a triple bypass surgery, followed by a few days mother, uh, later her mother died, and her sister also had eyelid surgery, which means that she has to be very careful about bringing up any grief with her sister. So... <laughs> I mean, let's pray for your friend. That's a lot of, it's a heavy burden to carry. Sally. I'm grateful to be back in Florida, kind of. Uh, are you in the, the mic? Again, I'm grateful to be back from Florida, kind of. Um, I just had a wonderful weekend and a reunion with some old, old friends and um, walked on the beach and swam in the water and communed with the Pelicans. Mm. Welcome back from Florida, and we've got a good time visiting with friends. Right. Oh, Catherine. Thank you. Um, this is a prayer for peace. Um, we need peace all over the world, um, but we need peace in, I, I wish for peace in Israel, Palestine, the West Bank, all over the Middle East. I pray for the children, the grandparents, the parents, the doctors, all those who are suffering. Yeah, let's continue to pray for those in the Middle East. But also let's pray for the Russian citizens and the horrible attack on their country that they experienced, and for those whose hearts are so hardened that they would feel the need to do something that awful. <laughs> So Tim's and my four youngest children um, all have things going on that are making their hearts heavy in different, all four different. Um, so just prayers for them to have each of their troubles lifted and for each of them to start experiencing joy again. Let's pray for your children and for them to experience joy. 
Mary. Hi. I just want to um, express gratitude for the kindness of strangers in all kinds of events. I heard from a Russian friend today who was talking about the extraordinary courage of many who came to the rescue of those inside the Crocus Theater there the other day. Um, more close to home, since she isn't here, um, on behalf of the Riley family, I don't know if any of you are, many of you are familiar with a dog saga there, but Hannah Riley's little dog went missing last week for about four days. And she's a savvy gal, Hannah is, and she got on Twitter and had people all over Atlanta and around the world concerned. And the lo little dog turned up. She is now home, thanks to the kindness of many strangers. And uh, I hope that Susan and Hannah are listening right now, because you can't say this, but uh, it was a wonderful story. And it, it's, um, I think it made it to USA Today. <laughs> Some said displaced Kate Middleton for a nanosecond. Anyway, it was a nice story. Well, let's pray for the kindness of strangers, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, but also for the social media <laughs> um, when it can be used constructively. <laughs> Tim. Just uh, prayers for our four-year-old grandson who's been in the hospital for a few days with a hip infection, and um, very tough for a four-year-old being in the hospital and for his parents, so his prayer for a quick treatment and that he won't be in the hospital for more than a, a day or two longer. Everybody's ready to go home, I think. And his little sister, who's two year, years old, misses him. Uh, we pray for your grandson and your granddaughter. If there are no further prayers, joys, or concerns from the congregation, I invite you to enter a moment of silence before I begin my pastoral prayer. Gracious God, in this season of in-betweenness, where you find us in the contours and contrasts of all that life is offering us right now, we pray for your help, for your love and compassion, for humility as we deal with those who are struggling from illnesses, death, the loss of people and pets they love. We pray for this world, those who are suffering in it. We think in particular of those in the Middle East who experience inexpressible loss and sorrow, but also for those who feel the need to fight whenever they have anger. We pray for softened hearts, swords beaten into plowshares, and for love to rule where there is hatred and apathy. We think of those in Russia who experienced a horrific attack in the theater and we also pray for those whose hearts are so hardened that they would carry out such a brutal attack. Please, God, find a way to bring mercy into this world. It does seem like our suffering index is increasing. It seems as if there is no light beyond the darkness. So in these moments when we're feeling this way, God, speak to our hearts. Let us enter your presence with trembling. Open us up to new forms love can take. Find ways where we can bring courage and compassion into a world that is suffering so deeply. And please, God, wherever our loved ones are at, wherever there is suffering, wherever there is sorrow, Help us find ways to bring your joy, light, and life back into this world. And now let us come before your throne, kneeling before you, offering up our own prayers, joys, and concerns.
now let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward as we take up our collection for this week. This is what I like to call our giving moment, the time where we give back to the church all that the church has done for us. This church has been around for 200 years, sustained itself on love. It will sustain itself for 200 years based on the love that we give, share. So please, share your time, talent, and treasure, but most of all, your love. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you today with our gifts, our time, our talent, our treasure. But we, the people of God, come before you offering ourselves. We ask that you bless us and sanctify us and make us acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing our hymn of preparation, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. As this, this is uh, Palm Sunday, you're invited to wave your palm branch around. You may be seated. The New Testament liturgy of the Passion is taken from Mark, chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass for him. And he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into that time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So ends the reading.
Jesus found a donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. I invite you to pray with me always one more time. Gracious and everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Just a little warning. Things may get a little heavy here at first, but I promise I will chill out midway through the sermon. Well, we've reached that moment in our Lenten journey that is, for me at least, the most difficult and arduous. A place located within the disquieted beauty of cheering crowds and the silent procession toward death. Or another way to interpret this moment is that of disquieted silence. A time and place where con contrasting images are used to convey something words alone cannot express. I am referring, of course, to our Palm Sunday and the Passion of Christ, but also to the conflicting realities found in everyday life, such as the bewildering shifts in our weather, immeasurable suffering and despair amid unprecedented gluttony and wretched excess, and the toxic relationship between religion and nationalism spreading in our country and throughout the world. There was something linking these conflicting realities to our text, but I struggled to find the connection between the two. Surely something must emerge out of this montage between present day cultural issues and our text, a third meeting that informs our understanding of both. Yet the more I thought about this text, particularly Palm Sunday, the more frustrated I became. You see, Palm Sunday ought to be a celebratory occasion. So as I prepared for this sermon, even I was curious as to why it hit me sideways. So first off, I decided to take a step back and collect my thoughts. I thought about where our Lenten journey has taken us and reflected then on where it is leading. Our overall theme is unbecoming, the ridding of who and what we are not to embrace all that we are and are meant to be. Inherent in this journey is the understanding that Lent entails more than just a religious observation. It is something we are invited to join as we navigate our way through life's contradictions to find light and love where there is despair and death. On further reflect, reflection, I realized that what frustrated me about this text wasn't the text itself, but my lack of appreciation for its subversive and seditious meaning, its clever use of time, space, movement, contradictory images, and John's radical interpretation of prophetic literature to convey an understanding of God that is difficult to understand today as it was when Jesus silently entered Jerusalem on a donkey's colt. Yet there was something else casting a shadow over this text, and it wasn't just my inability to find meaning within its disquieted silence. There is something happening here in the present day that is impeding my understanding of Palm Sunday in its historical context. So the second thing I did was to take some time and examine what that was. As I thought a little bit more about this, I was struck by the startling contrast between John's understanding of God as exemplified by Jesus' model of servanthood and how this image has been distorted in populist culture. There were two recent news stories that brought this to my attention over this past week while preparing the sermon. The first was a recent interview between social commentator Bradley Onishi and Terry Gross from NPR highlighting the growing influence of Christian nationalism across the country. Onishi shared how Christian nationalists advocate the Seven Mountain Mandate, which states that Christians aren't called to practice a faith of love and truth. Instead, they seek to control the government, family structures and social order, religion, business, education, media, arts and entertainment, the Seven Mountains. One symbol of this movement is the Appeal to Heaven flag, which features a green pine tree against a white background with that phrase, Appeal to Heaven, as its backdrop. For those who think this is a fringe political movement, that flag currently stands outside the office of our current US Speaker for the House of Representatives. The second news story that caught my eye was on the financial and ideological roots of Christian nationalism. 
Earlier this month, there was an article posted online by Talking Points Memo that reported a leading organization behind its rise, S-A-C-R, pronounced SACR, the Society for American Civic Renewal. Well funded by billionaire donors, SACR used their money to form an influential think tank called the Claremont Institute, funded regressive poli-sci and cultural studies programs at Hillsdale College, and has established its own news media called TP USA, Talking Points America. SACR takes for its symbols two versions of the cross used in early Christianity, St. Peter's and the anchor. Together, they turn into a sword and shield, a not so subtle message of their true intent. Sacker's ideal for government rule is based off of Afrikaner Bruderbond, the secret of rulers of Dutch South Africa under apartheid. Their influence is so widespread and deeply entrenched in our political system that Claremont Institute's president, Ryan Williams, received the National Humanities Medal five years ago under a different president. Do the math and you figure out who. It was against this backdrop that I revisited our Palm Sunday reading and wondered how this story was used to convey an understanding of Jesus that words alone can't express. In other words, who is Jesus? And how does he reveal one way God wants to be seen and followed? It is my thesis that Jesus, as seen in the Palm Sunday narrative, presents a subversive and seditious challenge to religious nationalism as well as cultural superiority. Through the use of disquieted silence, a different understanding emerges from within the seams of this text. It is, it is this depiction and understanding of Jesus that speaks to our current phase of our Lenten journey. I'm a little over halfway through this sermon and as promised, we'll chill out now. So let's do a little exegesis and have some fun. Just as with Lent, Palm Sunday is more than just a Christian holiday. It is an invitation to enter the narrative space and see the world from John's perspective. The best way to do this is to look at the events that shaped his faith and his gospel. If you recall from my past sermons, John outlived all the other disciples and was the only one to die a natural death. He also witnessed the deaths of John the Baptist, his first teacher, Jesus, the man he loved and the God he would follow, the destruction of the second temple and the scattering of the Jesus movement throughout the Roman Empire. So let's accept John's invitation. Join him within the Palm Sunday narrative and pay careful attention to his use of time, space, movement, and contradictory images to convey an understanding of God that informs our Lenten journey. Using disquieted silence, John contrasts the images of a great crowd waving palm branches and shouting with that of Jesus sitting quietly on a donkey's colt. This, is, this image was seen as seditious to Roman leaders as well as to the Sanhedrin. Let's examine how. The first time John uses that phrase, great crowd, is when Jesus feeds the 5,000 on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, back in chapter six, verse five. The last time occurs just before his execution by the Roman governor of, of Judea, Pontius Pilate. In our literary set, um, setting, Jesus speaks volumes to the crowds, whether in the past, present, or future, without uttering a single word. What goes unmentioned in our text, but was known by John and the Jesus movement, is the apocryphal roots and the nationalist aspirations behind crowds waving palm trees. This text draws from the book of 2 Maccabees, which was written sometime between 150 and 100 before the Common Era, and also draws on the post-exilic literature found in the Psalms, 2 Isaiah and Zechariah. In 2 Maccabees, a messenger of God, Judas Maccabeus, intervenes on behalf of diaspora Jews to lead them in a military victory over the foreign villains occupying Jerusalem. He enters Jerusalem sword in hand, killing foreigners and Jewish blasphemers. He was met with music, dancing, and palm leaves by his followers. In post-exilic literature, the Messiah rides into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt. Both texts imply their Messiah was a member of the priestly class and a military leader. Jesus, however, without a cross, sword, or shield, rides a donkey's colt into Jerusalem and then allows himself to be arrested without a fight. For those who wanted their leader to be a nationalist warrior and a religious zealot exemplified by Judas Maccabeus and by the prophetic literature, Jesus subverts that model and is depicted instead as a servant 
a servant of God offering eternal life to all who seek light and love where there is darkness and despair. At the same time, John is sending a seditious message to Pontius Pilate, King Herod of Galilee, Tiberius Caesar in Rome, as well as all who would misappropriate this text in the future. The ultimate identification of God with humankind isn't that of a military, autocratic, or authoritarian ruler. True leadership means identifying with those who exist on the underside of history, addressing the suffering human condition, meeting their unmet needs, and uniting a common cause with all who strive to make the world a better, more inclusive, compassionate, and egalitarian place. Instead of ruling over people, John repeatedly emphasizes the servant model of discipleship. Jesus serves God by humbly serving humankind. From Tiberius to Pilate, the Jesus movement, with its notion of radical love, inclusivity, equality, threatened the stability of an empire that was held together by military power, economic might, and strict social and religious divisions. Jesus' procession into Jerusalem was a seditious act, and that's exactly how it was interpreted by the Roman Empire. I'd like to close my sermon on this note. The message that John is sending through Palm Sunday in the Passion of Christ narratives isn't advocacy for religious chauvinism, nationalism, or cultural superiority. There is a third meaning emerging from this montage that informs our reading of this text and present day cultural issues. Humility. It isn't found in our text, yet it loudly resonates throughout Palm Sunday and the Passion narratives. In our Lenten journey, it is important to embrace Christ's spirit of compassion and humility as we grow into our faith, personally and collectively. As we embrace and feel the love and light of Christ, and let us also humbly serve God by addressing the suffering human condition. Speak out on behalf of those who can't or are too afraid. Fight for eco-justice, egalitarianism, affordable housing, anti-hunger initiatives. Find community with our ecumenical and secular, and secular siblings and share love and light wherever there is darkness and despair. Okay. You may be labeled seditious and subversive, but this is also a way to experience a deeper connection to God, our planet, and one another. Therefore, wave your palm trees, your palm leaves. Wave them proudly. Allow yourselves to unbecome, then become. Be humble, imperfect, mischievous, bold and free. And don't forget to be a little seditious and subversive along the way. Trust me, it's fun. <laughs> Amen. Let's enter into a moment of silence before we stand and sing our final hymn. Let us please stand and sing our final hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, number 472.
And now, beloved of God, hear this benediction. May you find Christ in the low places, where people are afraid, unfed, lost, and need shelter. May you meet Christ in a spirit of compassion and humility, with those who live without love, the abandoned, the forgotten. Sorry. <laughs> I have no control when it hits me. <laughs> and may Christ's light shine within your heart as we walk together to the promised land. Amen.